Everybody, this is Roxana. Say hi, Roxana. Hi, Roxana. She's a little nervous. I tell her there's nothing to be nervous about. Roxana, have you professed Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Yes. Upon your profession of faith, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Good morning and welcome to Living Hope. My name is Jeannie Greenman and these are the ways that you can get more involved in our church. Our students need help getting to camp, so don't forget to stop by and get your steaming hot baked potato today at 11.30 a.m. and 1 p.m. There are all the fixings ready to go right on top of it. Do you want to be part of Jesus Touching Our Community? We need you. Our VBS is coming up in July and we need volunteers. If you're interested, we will be having a team planning meeting on May 18th from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. in room 127. You won't want to miss it. Our men's ministry is having a hatchet throwing event on May 18th at 6 p.m. They will be going to Tomahawk in Apple Valley. It costs $20 and you need to register ahead of time online at our website. Another way you can help our students get to camp is by participating in rent a team. On the church website, when you log in, you'll see forms. Go ahead and click that and register for a time between April 1st to May 31st to have some of the students come out and help you with anything you need around the house. Skate Riot is getting ready to do some community outreach and we need water bottles. If you would like to donate water bottles, you can drop them off in the church office. On the back of the seat in front of you, there are some QR codes or they're in the chat on the online service. This is how you can learn more about how to get involved with our church. Here at Living Hope, we believe in taking the next steps in your spiritual walk, and we want to help you do that. So click welcome if you're new to us and you just want to get a little bit more information on us, because we'd love to get some information from you about what you're looking for in a church, what you're interested in, whatever it is that you have to say. Next to the welcome code, you will see a serve code. This is how you get involved in working with one of our ministries. There are so many great opportunities to serve God at our church, and we would love to have you join us in that. If you would like to support Living Hope financially, you'll notice we pass the plates. We also have some black boxes at the back of the sanctuary where you can drop off your tithes and offerings after the service. Or you can scan the gift code on the seat back in front of you and make your donation electronically. We want to make sure that everyone is comfortable however they choose to give. Thank you for joining us at Living Hope. We know that we're going to enjoy getting to know you, and we hope that you enjoy getting to know us. Have a great week. Good morning, everybody. If you have a Bible, turn to the book of Genesis chapter 11. The book of Genesis chapter 11. We are actually, these are our final two sermons as we've been going through Genesis 1 through 11. And so we're going to spend the next couple of weeks looking at the Tower of Babel. And we'll walk through that together over the next couple of weeks. Man, it smells good in the foyer. That's just wrong. So we'll, we'll get through this as we go. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for joining us online as well. And if you have a Bible, like I said, Genesis 11, beginning in verse 1. We're going to read verses 1 through 9. The whole earth had the same language and vocabulary. As people migrated from the east, they found a valley in the land of Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, Come, let us make oven-fired bricks. They used brick for stone and asphalt for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the sky. Let us make a name for ourselves, otherwise we will be scattered throughout the earth. Then the Lord came down to look over the city and the tower that humans were building. The Lord said, if they have begun to do this as one people all having the same language, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let's go down there and confuse their language so that they will not understand one another's speech. So from there, the Lord scattered them throughout the earth, and they stopped building the city. Therefore, it is called Babylon, for there the Lord confused the language of the whole earth, and from there the Lord scattered them throughout the earth. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you for this time of worship and time in your word. 
And Lord, as I pray every week, I pray that I would decrease and you increase. Speak to our hearts and to our minds, not just for information, but for transformation. Make us more like Jesus for your glory and your kingdom. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Amen. I want to start this week by talking about sin's corruption. And some people will not understand maybe what that means, but I think it'll flesh itself out as we look at it here and as we look at it in our lives today. Corruption simply defined as this, dishonest or fraudulent conduct for the purposes of control or power. The deterioration of something or the process of causing error. We can see we see corrupt governments, corrupt businesses. We also see uh, uh, things that deteriorate. You can say something is being corrupted. It's just being destroyed, deteriorated. People put viruses out in the world, and so these viruses tend to corrupt data. And So that's what the word corruption means. And the ultimate effect of sin, as we've talked about this as it's prevalent all through Genesis 1 through 11, is its corruption of humanity. And it's ultimately fleshed out in Genesis 11. Genesis 11 is a remarkable passage of Scripture. It's, it's very poetic. It's for a lot of word plays in the Hebrew that are done in here, which tells you that, uh, how God inspired it to be put together uh, in doing that. But I want to kind of go in a direction that talks about these things on a more, more personal and practical level here today. To understand Genesis chapter 11, you've got to go back to Genesis 9, verse 1. That's when Noah comes out of the ark, uh, the flood has come back, and he can come out of the ark, and he said, God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. As we get to Genesis chapter 11, that was the command, that was part of the covenant that we looked at last week between God and Noah, that that one of the things that they were supposed to do is go and fill the earth. Well, they, they start moving in that process, and they get to this lovely valley called Shinar, and they say, you know what, this is a nice looking valley. It's got some nice homes, it's got nice, some nice golf courses, there's a Costco over there on the street. And say, well, why don't we just stay here? In fact, we'll build what they call, it's called a ziggurat, and it's just a tower. Basically, you'll see them all over the ancient world. They're very prevalent in that way. They, very much like the pyramids, you would think of them as kind of a, a ziggurat in that sense. And so they begin to build this thing, and they, they build it out of things that they create. They create the bricks, the blocks, before everything was built on rock. And they begin to build it up, and they say, you know, all these things. And they're all able to do this because they are all speaking the same language. Now, as we'll talk about a little bit later, for you and me, that sounds like a pretty cool thing. I mean, that would seem a lot easier if we all just spoke the same language. How many of us know that all of us speak English in this room, but we don't all speak the same language? We just got back from uh, South Africa, as many of you guys know, and we were there in uh, Istanbul, and Istanbul has this huge relatively new airport. It's considered a remarkable airport, and actually it's a a fantastic thing. But if you go to airports all across most of the world, what you'll see? English signs. I can pretty much fly across this planet in an airport, and I can find my gate, and I can find out where to get, and I can find out all these things. They're in English, even though they may be in Turkey or in South America or all of these kinds of places. And so they, they, they were supposed to go and populate. They decide, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to stay here and make a name for ourselves. And God comes down and says, uh, I don't think so. And I'm, some of you in here probably already thinking, well, what's the big deal? It's a huge deal. And we'll talk about that. It's, it's the full evolution of, uh, if you will, of, of sin's corruption of man. See, as followers of Jesus, we must constantly be aware of the corruption that sin can bring in our lives, and we ought to embrace God's solution even though it doesn't make sense to us. And so I want to talk about that in just a few moments that we have together here this morning, as long as my voice will go. As y'all can tell, my voice is recovering. I lost it last week during the, the message and then was really gone Monday and trying to get it back slowly here, so We'll see how long I can go with this. First thing, got to understand, corruption begins when God is removed and his purposes are ignored. Corruption begins when God is removed and his purposes are ignored. 
Noah's descendants were to repopulate the earth. They were not to settle in one place. You see, folks, when we remove God from our thinking, from our way of life, we have to come up with something to fill that void. We have to come up with something to fulfill those purposes in our lives that that we have in this. And if it's not from God, it's corrupted, no matter how good it is. It doesn't matter how worthy it is. If it's not from God, it's corrupted. Now, some of you are already balking. You're already thinking, is, 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 this is very simple. Some of you here, like, you know what, you know, I, you know this whole God thing, but you know what, I, I've, I've been a good person, I've lived a good life, God has, uh, or I've been blessed to do a lot of things, I've got a good business, I've got a good family, I've done all the things to, to live out this, this American dream and, and to do the decisions that, that I've prospered through and all of that, but let me ask you a question, did you consult God in any of it? Did you ask God if that was what he wanted you to do? See, it can look good. It can sound good. It can shine real good. But if it's not from God, it's from something else. And if it's not from God, that makes it corrupt. Now, we don't like those kind of words, but that's just the ultimate thing. We see this in Genesis. We've seen it from Genesis 3, from, from when Adam ate of the apple, when from Eve was deceived, Adam ate. We see Cain and Abel, all this you see walking through. We're going to come down later, and we'll get a few chapters down after we see it. We see Sodom and Gomorrah, which is the other time that God comes down. We see God comes down to see this tower, which is an interesting phrase. He comes down to see Sodom and Gomorrah, too. You almost get the sense that God is just absolutely amazed at the level of depravity that man is able to, able to achieve when left to his own accord, to his own power, to his own decisions. You see, while God started a whole new human race, if you will, with Noah, there's one thing that came from Adam. Sin. Noah, did, uh, Noah carried sin with him. His kids, his descendants carried sin with them. And just like we saw before the flood, it doesn't take long for humanity to get rid of God. And the minute you get rid of God, it's corrupt. It's the inevitable conclusion of man being left to himself. Truth is, folks, that in the world we live in today, if it wasn't for the church, it wasn't for what we call the common grace of God, humanity would have blown itself up a long time ago. We certainly have the means now. I stand amazed looking at history. It's like, how in the world did we not blow ourselves up? It's funny, we're not scared of anything, but all of a sudden we create all these weapons to blow ourselves up 20 times over, but nobody has the itch to push the button. Somebody will one day. Why? Because that's the corruption of sin. 1 John 2.15 says this. John says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and pride in one's possessions, it is not from the Father, but it's from the world. And the world with its lust is passing away, but the one who does the will of God remains forever. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride in one's possessions. Those are corrupt things. It should not be part of us as followers of Christ to have that, but we just know that's the inevitable conclusion. Corruption begins when we remove God. And in the things you do in life and the decisions you make in life as followers of Jesus, God gives you the choice to listen or not. To obey or not. And all of us say, well, if I was God, I wouldn't give us that choice. Yes, you would. Because if you're going to impose that kind of rule on you, you have to impose it on yourself, and you don't want to be able to tell, have anybody telling you what to do. And so in life, as we live life, as we grow in life, as we do these things that we do in life, there's a lot of good things that we do, 
a lot of worthy things that man does. But if they're not from God, they're corrupt. See, it's not the easy stuff that we're able to figure out. That which is good, that which is bad, that which it's, it's the things that are I'm not sure about. The things that are kind of okay, but are they okay? And, and the devil knows these things. Our enemy knows these things. He knows it's not the obvious things. We kind of all know we shouldn't kill people. At least we say that. But when it comes to being angry at people, eh, we kind of like that one. We feel like we're justified to be angry at people. God says don't be angry. God says don't let the sun go down in your anger. Well... Why is God right here, but he's not right there? See what I'm saying? When you remove God from the picture, corruption is inevitable. We have to be careful as followers of Christ that the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride in one's possessions doesn't overcome us, even though it's maybe good. Corruption begins when God is removed and his purposes are ignored. Corruption continues as it affects the community that makes up the people. See, I love this. We live in a world today where everybody's about, and especially here in America, we have this, we have this thing we, call, we, we take pride in. We, take, uh, we advocate for individual freedom. And we say it now today in Christianity, we say things, this is my personal relationship with God, Right? You hear me say it, I've heard you, you say it, and so we have this personal relationship with God. My, my relationship with God is personal. Okay, how do you live that out? How do you live that out? We're gathered here in this room this morning. We were gathered in the previous service. There'll be a service at 12, a community. We all come together at one, but every now and then in these things, we go out into the foyer and we cross-contaminate cross with each other, to use the lack of a better word. We are living in community with one another. You are living out your individual relationship with God by living it out in community. We don't live in a vacuum. God doesn't want us to live in a vacuum. God doesn't live in a vacuum. God is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. God exists in community. We are the image of God. We are to exist in community as well. That's why we have churches. We're supposed to live out our individual faith in a community of faith. And when it gets corrupted, and when, in the world when we get corrupted, we don't, live, we don't live our lives in a vacuum. People who don't know Jesus, they don't live their lives in a vacuum. Somebody is affected by the decisions you make and I make every single day. You say, no, that's not true. Somebody is affected. We do not live in a vacuum. I always love how people like to sit there and, and, and think that it is a biblical thing to go off and buy 800 acres in the middle of Idaho, put your little 10 by 10 log cabin on it, and put the fence out there on the edge of the 800 acres and say, that's living in community, and that's what God wants me to do. And I'm like, mm -hmm. We live out community together. And when sin gets into a community, when sin gets into the world, we see this here. The community there. There's a bunch of individuals who are gathering and who are migrating as they are commanded to do, but then this guy comes along. You know who we're talking about here? Nimrod. Nimrod's kind of like the first warrior conqueror we kind of confront here in Scripture. And this is Nimrod. And Nimrod says, We don't need to go anywhere. We got this. We'll stay here. We'll build our own kingdom. We'll build our own tower. And it'll reach to the heavens. Well, Nimrod's decision to have he was this mighty warrior and conqueror, who did it affect? Everybody who stayed with him. Corruption seeps to the next. In the Ten Commandments, it talks about how, how the, in the commands, how it, all those things affect the third and fourth generation. How does that work? Well, it's very simple because at the time, that's how people lived. You had the patriarch of the family, and guess who was living around him? All of the relatives and everything. Guess how many relatives were living around that time? 
three and four generations of people were living around the patriarch at one time. The patriarch had tremendous influence on the entire family. What they believed, how they lived, what they did affected to the third and fourth generation. Corruption knows no bounds. And so when we ignore God in our own lives and we ignore God in the decisions we make in our own lives and pretend like he's not there, which is what people often try to do, you end up living out those kinds of decisions and they affect other people within the community. It affects us in, the, in your home. It affects you in your business. It affects you in the community. It affects us in our governance of one another. It affects us tremendously. This is sin's ultimate. You don't sin in a vacuum. Somebody else is always affected by it. And it just manifests itself over time. Notice the word they use, otherwise us. They say us, we, us. Us is a very bad word when it comes to Christianity. I is a good, not a good word. Community is about we. Community is about God. And we see the effects of this. We live this out in our world today and, and even then. But, you know... Everybody says that their generation is the worst generation. Everybody thinks that all is theirs. But if you look back at church history, you look back at history here and even in the Old Testament, man, you can't, every generation felt like they were living in the worst generation ever. Why? Because sin is corrupt and corrupts completely. Look at what Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3. But know this, hard times will come in the last days. You realize that everybody back in the the New Testament felt like they were living in the last days. The last days have been the last days for a really long time. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, proud, demeaning, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, Slanderers, without self-control, brutal, without love for what is good, traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness but denying its power. Avoid these people, for among them are those who worm their way into households and deceive gullible women. Don't get mad at me, Paul wrote it overwhelmed by sins and led astray by a variety of passions, always learning and never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Isn't that the world we live in today? As a general rule, we see this. You don't want it to be true of you. We don't often like to think about these things. We don't want to confront or face these things ourselves. And, you know, we, we like to throw, we like to project depravity on other people. But I'm perfect. Or, or, or uh, my, my corruption is not as bad as their corruption. And since mine is not as bad as theirs, I'm okay. And that's just not true. Corruption is corruption. Being boastful and proud and ungrateful and unholy. These should not be things. This is what sin does to us. This is what happens when God is removed. We see with Babel, we see this, there's the tense. This week we're just talking about this part. Next week we're going to talk about the corruption of religion because that's what ends up happening here. The inevitable corruption of self, the inevitable corruption of governance of self, and inevitably leads to a corruption of religion because religion is about man, it's not about God. And so we need to understand that corruption starts with uh, us when we remove God and our purposes are ignored. It affects the community around us because we make up a community around us. And then cul- corruption culminates in our governance. What do I mean by that? Even as followers of Jesus, we struggle governing ourselves. That's where it starts. 
If it starts with our individual decision to ignore God and his presence in our lives, and it inevitably comes to the conclusion that corruption would fester itself out, is that we don't have a way to control ourselves. See, God knows this. As followers of Jesus, the Bible tells us that we have the Holy Spirit in us, Christ in you, hope of glory. We have a comforter. We have a counselor. We have the means to do these things. It makes you immediately go to the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Against these things there is no law. And I've told you guys this at the time. It's a perfect time to remind you of these things. And if you've never heard it before, you could take it. It's a buck ninety-five. It's free. There you go. Let's go with that. If you struggle with patience and you pray for patience, you're praying the wrong thing. If you are a follower of Jesus, then you have the Holy Spirit in you. And he is working in you. And if the fruit of the manifestation of the Holy Spirit in our lives is manifested in love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control, then you already have that which you need in order to accomplish what God wants you to accomplish. And so the problem with you is not that you don't have patience. The problem is that you refuse to surrender to God. If you like to get angry... If you got a short fuse, the Bible says don't get angry. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. God, help me with my anger. Wrong prayer. God, help me to surrender to the power of the Holy Spirit in me so that I won't get angry. I lack self-control. I just can't help myself. You're right. See, if you're trying to deal with anger and patience and self-control in your own, I agree with you. you got a problem. But the solution is right there in you as a follower of Jesus. If you are not a follower of Jesus, then you are right. You have an anger, self-control problem that you will never be able to solve in yourself because of the corruption of sin in your heart and in your life. It is the inevitable consequence of the corruption of sin that these things manifest, manifest themselves. But if you are a follower of Jesus, you have the ability from God himself to control and govern yourself. We all do. We all make those choices every single day to say, I'll let him control this, but I'm not going to let him control that. That becomes an issue of surrender and lordship. And this for a lot of people is very hard, and it shouldn't be hard for the follower of Jesus. So then we start being defensive and we lash out. Even as Christians, we'll lash out. And we'll project that on somebody else, even though I'm the one who has the problem. The inevitable consequence of corruption of sin is that we can't govern ourselves very well. And then we struggle. And then we say, why God? God, why is this happening to me? And you say, and then you come back with your religion. We'll talk more about this next week. God, why is this happening to me? I read my Bible. As if God's entitled to give you something because you read your Bible. I go to church, God. Why, is this, why am I struggling with this? I don't know. Why are you? You want to govern yourself, you got to give up yourself. You want to have control over that which controls your life that's apart from God, you got to give it to God and let Him work. And that shouldn't seem like some abstract concept. It's very simple. It's very simple. 2 Peter 2, beginning of verse 18. 
For by uttering boastful, empty words, they seduce with fleshly desires and debauchery people who have barely escaped from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of of corruption. Since people, listen to me, this is Peter, this is God's word, people are enslaved to whatever defeats them. That sends corruption in your life. If we can't control ourselves, if we can't govern ourselves, the inevitable consequence of that is we live in a society that is corrupted by sin. Psalm 2, beginning in verse 1, says this, Why do the nations rage and the peoples plea, plot, I'm sorry, plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers conspire together against the Lord and his anointed one. Let's tear off their chains and throw their ropes off of us. Isaiah 1 4 says this, O sinful nation, people weighed down with iniquity, brood of evildoers, depraved children. This is Israel. They have abandoned the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They have turned their backs on Him. Romans 1, Paul says this, And because they did not think it worthwhile to acknowledge God, God delivered them over to a corrupt mind so that they do, I'm saying they do what is not right. They are filled with all unrighteousness, evil, greed, and wickedness. They are full of envy, murder, quarrels, deceit, and malice. They are gossip, slanderers, God-haters, arrogant, proud, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, senseless, untrustworthy, unloving, and unmerciful. Although they know God's just sentence, they, that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but even applaud others who practice them. I could have pulled that out of the of your Google feed this morning. The inevitable consequence of the corruption of sin is that a nation that ignores God, forgets God, chooses to abandon God is the inevitable consequence of sin, which leads to these things that Paul describes here in Romans. And it says that God just says, man, it got so bad that he just, he just you want it? Here it is. You got it. And I'm often uh, amazed because we know we, we forget how blessed we are to live in our country. For those of you that are old enough to remember, you remember the, the, the good old days when you were Americans <laughs> and you had your Marlboro cigarettes in your back of your Levi jeans driving your pickup truck with the gun rack in the back. Hallelujah. <laughs> or you remember a time when it was just you and you were 21 years old and you had your 57 Chevy, you were cruising the streets. <laughs> and in the midst of all that, you felt like we were a much more Christian nation, right? We, we, it's hard to ignore that in our nation's history, We are built upon a Judeo-Christian ethic. That is absolutely true. It's hard to deny that. And something got lost along the way. That's another way. God is no longer in the picture. God is thrown out of the picture more and more now. And I get it. I experience the same frustrations as you do. But it's the inevitable consequence of corruption of sin. And it's so funny, as we were in uh, South Africa, I was having a discussion, we were having a discussion, um, those who were there, you remember this, we were having a, a discussion about, uh, we had a Muslim guy come and share with us. It was a fascinating discussion, talking about reaching uh, Muslims, because uh, there were many in the region that where we were at, and, 
and he, we were talking about the fact that he had, he had a friend come and visit America, and he went to visit another friend in Seattle. And they, were, they saw that on the news that there was, there was these billboards, and these billboards were blasphemous against God, against Jesus. He talked about him and his friend and his friend, and they went and they started painting over these signs, these billboards, you know, it's like, cause, and they, they, the question was asked, it was interesting to me, it's like, how come more Christians in America don't do stuff like that? I was like, well, first of all, my thinking was it's illegal. It's called vandalism. I mean, if you want to die on that hill, I guess you can, but most of us don't. But we also, I said, we also have a thing in America, and it always amazes me because everybody says they seem to have this, called freedom of speech. People are, are free to say things and express things. And they're free to express things that you and I don't like. Maybe views that you and I don't share. And it seems like there's more and more of that in our country today, especially when it comes to matters of personal faith in Jesus and Christianity and living out our faith in the world we live in. And for those of you who've been in this country long enough to know, it's like, man. But you should have seen, I remember the quizzical look I got when I said, we have freedom of speech in this country. It's in our Constitution, so we don't do that. And it was just like, see, everybody has an idea that they have freedom of speech until they don't have freedom of speech. So we are blessed to live in a nation, but it's certainly not God-fearing. We're a much more secular nation than we used to be. But as you travel and as you go and see other places in the world, they're much more secular than us. They're much more Muslim than us. So we got to understand that. But it's the inevitable conclusion of sin's corruption that society ends up reflecting and looking that way as well. And we see these things all the time. And these things are even being lived out in the church. We live in such a polarizing time. It's, it, and it just seems to be getting worse. And the presidential elections don't help it at all. And all of those things that are reflected out there in the world that we like to think is out there, out there, out there, they permeate into the churches as well. Because why? Because you are, don't live in a vacuum. And you bring that stuff in here just like I bring my stuff in here. And in church life, it's crazy now. It's like, you know, we, you have to, we're much more tribal. And if you don't believe like my tribe, then I can't play with you. And that's the world we live in now. Even amongst denominations and churches, we agree on the divinity of Jesus. We believe, agree on the authority of God's words. Even in our own denomination, we agree on, on these things. But now some people would sit there and say, man, that church allows their pastor to preach in Hawaiian shirts. I can't work with that. We can't, we can't work together and get the gospel to the ends of the earth. All that garbage that's out there permeates in. And all that stuff is corrupt. Amen. And we bring that corruption in when we are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. That which was corrupt, corrupted is now incorruptible in Christ Jesus. And it just makes it much more difficult as we live in our world today. What's God's cure for corruption? I love this. Confusion. Amen. Remember, he made the covenant with Noah that he was not going to destroy the earth in a flood like he, he had just did. He's, so he's going to, going to do something. What's his purpose here? He, his purpose here is very simple. He has to get Israel back, or the, the descendants of Noah, back on track. What are they supposed to be doing? Populating the earth. The unity of humanity in language and purpose sounds good to us, except it lacks one very important detail. It didn't have God's approval. If God didn't want that, then it's 
wrong. And the minute you start saying, well, God will be okay with it, he's not okay with it. Partial obedience is still disobedience fully. We don't like that. I don't like that. I wish that Christianity was a halfway kind of thing. Many Christians live that way today. It's a halfway kind of thing. Hard to die halfway. Hard to offer your body as a living sacrifice halfway. The unity would only give them a false sense of power that would only lead to even greater destruction. Man, isn't that true? I mean, look at the world we live in today. It's amazing. What's the, it's a ridiculous thing that, that information, that information that we have access to, it like doubles every five years. We have all this information, and we're more confused than ever. We have this thing called artificial intelligence coming along, and we, we old folk are scared to death of it. The young folk are all like, yeah, I got somebody else to do my homework, and I'm going to get A's. <laughs> This artificial intelligence is scary stuff. We can clone. We can recreate organs. Have you looked at how much we've climbed the tower? It makes me really wonder sometimes if, man, God just doesn't bring something where we all start babbling again. You know that all you seniors in here, AI can imitate your voice completely and perfectly. So much so that they can use your voice to call your bank and take everything out. It's about power, right? Corruption's about power. And everybody's about power. We had that whole season there where everybody was all, all uptight about these things, uh, about, about power and, 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 and all that stuff. I'm like, everybody's about power. Everybody wants control. And that's just how it works. Those who have power have power. Those who don't have power disrupt the systems that give that person power so that they can gain power. And then once they gain power, the people that lose the power go in to disrupt the systems that help them to gain power, and the circle is never ending. This is the corruption of sin. You want power over your life. You don't want God to have power over your life, so I'm going to get rid of those things that do that, things like church and community and worship and service. Same in church life, in society, in Congress, in Sacramento, in the school board meetings and city councils all across this nation. Everybody is about having power. And those who don't have it do what they can to remove it. Why do you think people are protesting on college campuses and they don't even know what they're protesting about? God is removed, something's got to fill the void. And that's what happens in your life. See, if God's not filling the void, you're going to, if you don't follow God, you're going to follow something. Amen. It's so funny. I was watching a, a video yesterday for school, and it was talking about uh, mission drift, and, and it was actually a business conference. And this guy, is a, he has a, a Christian business. It's in his mission statement everything. He was talking about drifting as a business because the purpose of his business is to glorify God and advance the gospel, even though he has a, a business that does this. And he's talking about how the danger of drifting 
from your original purpose. And you have to always be careful about that. It's very good. We have to worry about that in our church. You have to worry about it if you have a Christian business. You need to worry about it in your own Christian journey and in life. You get caught up in life and you start doing stuff and you start doing things. You did all these things for God when you were younger, but then all of a sudden you had a family, you had a job, you had all these obligations, and God got bumped over and over again. And all of a sudden what happens? God's over here and you're over there. Who drifted? God didn't. You did. And so he's talking about this, this worry about, about drift. It's like the uh, YMCA. Not the song. <laughs> what does YMCA mean? Young Men's Christian Association. Where was it started? In London. Why was it started? For kids to have some place to get off the streets and to learn the gospel. Have you been to a YMCA recently? Not a whole lot of Jesus, but a whole lot of drift. How about this? Ivy League colleges, many of them were started to advance the gospel and train up pastors. Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Brown. The, on the diploma that Harvard graduates will get or have gotten, I don't know when their semester ends and who, don't really care. But it still has the original Latin logo on it, which talks about Scripture, Christ. And so at Harvard, so all the, does Harvard have a Christian focus anymore? Yet their diploma lifts up Jesus and the Word of God. That's called drift. We drift because sin will do that to us. And you know what? Sometimes God brings what seems confusing in our lives to reorient us back to the relationship that he desires for us to have with him. I'm not going to read it. You can read it in your notes later, but Luke 15 reminds me of this. The prodigal son. Remember the prodigal son? Yeah. Sat there and had an inheritance, said, God, Dad, God, Dad, give me my inheritance. Dad gives him his inheritance. What's he do? Goes off and waits, waste it. God wastes it, and he wastes it. So much to the point where he finds himself in a pig pen, and he's fighting with pigs. And what does he do? What am I doing here? Why am I fighting with pigs for food. God had to get Noah's descendants on track to go and populate the earth so he confuses them and causes them to spread. Sometimes in life, God brings things in your life that are confusing, that don't make a lot of sense because you've abandoned him in your own life. You've forsaken him. He's not in your picture anymore. And because of that, now in your own life, you have this corruption, and this corruption manifests itself in your relationships, whether at work or at home or anything else. And now you're sitting there, and I'm like, this doesn't make any sense. And that could be God in your life saying, I'm right here. I'm right here. Maybe that's you today. You want to bring clarity to your life? You want to get rid of confusion? You've got to come to know Jesus as Lord. He's the only way. The only solution to sin is Jesus. Out of the corruption that sin brings in our lives and society, God gives us hope that is only found in knowing Jesus. I wrap up with this real quick. Revelation 18.9. Babylon comes to be known as that place of, of humanism and everything that is not God. In Revelation 18.9 it says this, The kings of the earth who have committed sexual immorality and shared her sensual and excessive ways will weep and mourn over her when they see the smoke 
from her burning. Babylon falls. Jesus is the one who overcomes. And as followers of Jesus, we have to constantly, constantly be aware of the corruption that sin brings into our lives and embrace his solutions even when they don't make a whole lot of sense. Amen? Amen. Let's all stand and pray. Every head bowed and every eye closed, please. Lord, we come before you now. We are humbled by your grace that you would, in the midst of the confusion and the depravity that surrounds us, you still love us, so much so that you sent your son Jesus to die for us. Lord, we pray your spirit move in our lives and in our heart. The only solution to the corruption that is in our souls is Jesus Christ. Trusting in him as Lord and Savior, believing he died on the cross for our sins, that he rose on the third day, that he ascended to your right hand, and that he is coming back, and when he comes back, Babylon will fall. Lord, that is our hope, is our only hope. I pray that there are those in this room who have never responded to you before, that your spirit is speaking to them now as we sing at this time.